After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It feels a long time since on Palm Sunday we were reflecting on a Byzantine representation of Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane before his betrayal. The solemn liturgy of this day marks the end of our week-long journey to Calvary. As we look at the cross, we confront for ourselves the pain and the sorrow of Good Friday. The liturgical reproaches often sung on this day during the veneration of the cross imagine Christ addressing us, O oh my people, what have I done to you, or in what have I grieved you? Answer me. Such words focus our minds inwards, forcing us on this most solemn of days to reflect on our own failings, our inability and refusal to listen to God's word, our repeated turning away from his ways. They remind us starkly how deeply our individual sins all hurt Christ and sharpen the pain of his agony on the cross. On that grim hillside, outside the walls of Jerusalem, yet within clear view of passers-by who could mock and deride him, Christ suffered for us, for our transgressions. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Now we are come to the end of the day. St John's narrative makes it clear that this evening was that of the day of preparation, the eve of the Sabbath. This added urgency to the need to remove Christ's body from the tree on which he had so shamefully been hanging, lifeless, since the middle of the afternoon. In Jewish law, all the dead required swift burial. Even criminals' bodies were not to be left on a cross after sunset. The evangelists stress on the imminence of the Sabbath, which would begin as soon as it got dark, reflects both a Jewish sense of outrage that a sacred day would be profaned, and a hope that on such a sensitive day, the Romans might consent to release Christ's body to avoid any trouble with the crowd. We haven't previously encountered this person, Joseph, who asked Pilate for permission to take the body. By describing him as coming from the Judean town of Arimathea, a detail common to all the Gospels, John seems to indicate that Joseph was not one of the people from Galilee who had followed Jesus. A prominent member of the Jewish community, a respected member of the council, Joseph cannot plausibly be identified with one of Jesus' supporters. John indeed says specifically that he was a secret disciple. We can scarcely imagine that Pilate would have agreed to hand Jesus' body over to one of his own followers. Yet clearly, Pilate also appreciated the urgency of getting this troublesome figure buried, so long as he could be sure that Jesus were really dead. St Mark's account adds an additional detail, not found in any other gospel, that Pilate sought the necessary confirmation from the centurion before releasing the body. As John Fenton argued, that was Mark's final reminder that there is no way that leads to life except by death, and that the death that brings us to life is the death of Jesus. Remember Paul's words to the Romans, have you forgotten that when we were baptised into union with Christ Jesus, we were baptised into his death? By that baptism into his death, we were buried with him. The image from the picture gallery at Christchurch that I've chosen to accompany this, our final meditation, depicts the removal of Christ's lifeless body from the tree. Entitled The Descent from the Cross, this painting is a surprisingly small copy of a monumental fresco by the 16th century artist Daniele da Volterra. It was created as the altarpiece for the centre of the Orsini Chapel in the church of Trinità dei Monti, above the Spanish steps in Rome. Although that chapel no longer survives, its splendour was once much admired. 
Nicolas Poussin described this fresco as one of the three most important paintings in Rome, together with Raphael's Transfiguration and Domenichino's Last Communion of St. Jerome, both of which are now in the Vatican. The copy gives no sense of the scale of the original. This was a huge painting with life-size figures. But even in the small image that we have before us, our eyes are drawn inevitably to the lifeless body of Christ at the centre and to the muscularity of the arms reaching out towards him. In Daniele's representation, as the men involved in the complex process teeter uneasily on fragile swaying ladders, Christ's body seems almost suspended in mid-air, scarcely supported by the anxious figure who nominally bears his weight, who is looking up nervously at his companions. Although the dead Christ is and should be our focus, we cannot ignore the distraught women at the front of the image, especially the almost prone figure of the Virgin in the bottom left. In its original location in the Orsini Chapel, she would virtually have been lying on the top of the altar. St John, standing to the right, has, for the time being at least, consigned Mary to the care of the other women. Instead, he, like us, looks up at Christ, his left arm raised, whether to speak or to reach out to touch and hold the precious body. We cannot learn. Malcolm Geith's poem from his sequence of sonnets for the Stations of the Cross beautifully encapsulates the process depicted here. A quiet taking down, a prizing loose, a cross beam lowered like a weighing scale. This is indeed ground zero, emptiness and space, with nothing left to say, or think, or do. For what confronts us on this Good Friday is the finality of death and the emptiness of that inert human form. In this image, in Geith's poem, on this the bleakest evening of the Christian year, Jesus is no longer with us. At that last awful moment on the cross, he cried out, and in the words from St John's account declared, it is finished, or perhaps better, it is accomplished or fulfilled, and he gave up his spirit. And so he departed from the human form in which he had humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even death on a cross. His body had become now just a shell, the mere figure of the man whom the disciples had known, his face still imprinted with the likeness of the infant child whom Mary bore, but devoid of his animating divine spirit. Unlike all the other images that we've been considering, no light shines from Christ's body in this painting. The loincloth reflects some of the last of the evening sun onto Jesus' dangling legs, but his face and body never come out from the shadow cast across them, for his divinity no longer illumines the corpse from within. We commented, in observing other paintings this week, on how Christ's body consistently stood out from those of the men around him, being both larger in the image in which he was crowned with thorns and displaying more marked muscular development in that image and in Naldini's Ecce Homo. Here, by contrast, it's the living figures reaching out to bear the body's weight whose muscles we can admire, not those of the dead man. At the evening hour, Christ lies in a tomb, rent out of the rock, hastily wrapped in a plain linen cloth. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is no longer here among us. He has gone to him who sent him, as he told his disciples he would. I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And yet, even now, after darkness had covered the whole earth, the earth had quaked, 
rocks been sundered and the veil of the temple rent in two, Christ the great I am is, even now, eternally with the Father. Today, he said to the penitent thief crucified beside him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And there he is now, even as we weep and watch here. Christ's suffering is the fulfilment of scripture and the accomplishment of the redemption of the human race, Luther wrote in a commentary on John's Gospel. All is fulfilled and completed, and no one may dispute it, as if anything remained to be fulfilled and completed. Christ is dead. God has died on the cross. Yet this is not the end. While we wait in the emptiness of these hours after Christ's crucifixion and burial, while we lament the suffering that our sins and transgressions brought upon him, we must contain our souls in patience, remembering the words of the psalmist. My soul waits for the Lord more than the night watch for the morning, more than the night watch for the morning. Let us pray. Almighty Father, hear our prayer and forgive us. Unstop our ears that we may receive the gospel of the cross. Lighten our eyes that we may see your glory in the face of your Son. Penetrate our minds that your truth may make us whole. Irradiate our hearts with your love, that we may love one another for Christ's sake. Amen.